Hello, today we're going to talk about uh, employee performance management. It's probably the most important topic in all of international business, possibly in all of business at all. So basically we're going to be talking about um, how you appraise performance of your employees and even more important, what do you do with that information. It's an obvious topic to discuss and it's not as simple as it may look. So why would you want to measure performance? Well, you know, any book will tell you this kind of known mundane stuff like, you know, you need to know uh, your, your employee performance and use it to motivate them to make promotion and uh, tenure decisions, uh, to select better employees, uh, to develop your employees, to avoid being sued, all that stuff. And yes, we all know that. But there are a number of more important questions that are not so obvious, but are equally and possibly even more important to the topic of performance management. For example, what should we measure? Like what constitutes performance? I mean, believe me, it's such a difficult topic. I'm currently on the committee uh, here at the university that um, uh, evaluates performance of professors. And so every year we have um, a best professor award. So somebody from our school receives an award for being a best professor. The committee is comprised of seven or eight people and um, you would think that it would be very easy to determine who is the best performing professor. <clears throat> we have all the data on them, you know, we have teaching evaluations, we have all kinds of other data. It's a very difficult task. Every year we have lengthy arguments as you know as to what we should take into account, as to how you should um, decide who is the best performer. Very, very difficult. I mean, define good professor. Is that someone whose students get the highest grades? Is that someone who is loved by students? Is it someone whose students have the strongest knowledge? Is it someone whose students get jobs? I mean, there are so many dimensions, so many components, and pretty much every person will have a different uh, understanding of that. I've seen that same exact same problem in business organizations that either I managed or worked for as a consultant. Very difficult. Take any employee and, you know, there will be 10 people and 10 will have different opinion as to what constitutes good performance in this particular position. Uh, very difficult. Now, how should we measure it? Even more difficult. I mean, um, should we use some sort of a self-report questionnaire? Should we use manager performance evaluation? Should we use customer evaluation? How would we use it? Would we just ask a question? Would we give some sort of a questionnaire? Would we uh, conduct an interview? I mean, how would we do that? Again, very, very difficult. In this lecture, by the way, we will talk about the different options, pros and cons of them, and you will see that it's not as simple. Plus, again, how frequently should we measure that uh, performance? How exactly would we do it? So who should do the performance? Uh, would the performance appraisal uh, be delivered in a one-on-one -on -one session? Should it be done publicly? Should your colleagues see your evaluations or not? Should it be done automatically or only when there is a problem? All those are important and difficult questions. Plus, again, you evaluated performance of your employees. Uh, you have the data. What do you do with them? I mean, are you going to increase salary of the people whose performance is better or not. We'll discuss why one or the other option may actually be a disastrous choice. So all those kinds of things are very important and I'm not even talking about the things like stress that comes with it. Again, if you have worked in, or in organizations, and I obviously have, as well as uh, managed organizations, as well as worked with many organizations, performance appraisal is a highly stressful event, both for the manager who delivers the news or uses the news, but also for the employees. I mean, this is a big deal. Sometimes you <laughs> want to not do it at all. So all those things matter. Now add to that the international dimension. I mean, it's becoming completely complex. I mean, uh, if, if you figured out how to do it in your country, that's good for you. It's not an easy task, but I can believe that you can figure that out. But when you have to manage people from different organizations, believe me, it's going to be incomparably more complex. Cultural differences matter, institutional differences matter, um, economic differences matter, all of those are a huge deal and we'll talk about them in this lecture. Now, 
So does culture matter? Before we even get in, into all those details. Oh yes, it does. Culture does matter. I work with people from all around the world on a regular basis. And believe me, I see so many problems. Um, I do something that is extremely welcome in one culture. And I had a huge, or normally would have, uh, or at least always from someone would have a huge outrage and um, a disagreement on my practice or, uh, you know, approach. Uh, happens all the time, like literally every single time I share some performance data. For example, the Xculture project that I manage, uh, every week we have information on student performance and then I also for myself compile it to the uh, instructor level, so I basically know how each student is doing, but also I know how each class and each instructor is doing. And occasionally I would decide to share that information with everyone so that, uh, well, first professors would see how their students are doing, so that part is obvious. But also uh, to see or to allow professors to see how they are doing compared to other professors. And you would think that would be a wonderful practice. I mean, on the one hand, people want to know how they do compared to others. On the other hand, I mean, why hide it? Uh, yet another, you know, uh, reason would be to perhaps, you know, praise the top performers and maybe a little, I don't know, shame the bottom performers. Um, <laughs> I do it and as I said, I would get letters from Americans saying, oh, thank you, good to know. And I would get letters from people in the Middle East saying, this is completely unacceptable. I mean, you cannot rank us. We are, you know, different people in different countries. Plus, it's politically incorrect, but it makes me look bad in, you know, in the eyes of my colleagues. So it's a, it's a very, very tricky issue. So, for example, how culture can play out here. Individualism, collectivism, right? You know what those are, you probably took the classes, and if you haven't taken classes that discussed individualism, collectivism, just based on the definition, you probably know what that is. Well, in individualist cultures, uh, performance based on individual achievement or individual input is preferred. And if you try to give somebody a grade based on team performance in an individualist country, often it just wouldn't work. People would say, yeah, my team didn't do well, but I did my part. Why should I get a low grade? <laughs> I get it all the time in Xculture because, again, one of the components there is uh, performance of the team. And my students are not very happy when they get a low grade based on the team performance, when their individual performance, performers was, uh, performance was high. In collectivist cultures, it tends to be the opposite. They tend to prefer team-based performance. Yes, maybe somebody happened to do better today, but uh, you know it's still a team effort, and uh, so they're much more comfortable with team-based rewards as opposed to individual-based rewards. In fact, um, I've seen a number of cases where American expatriate managers were trying to use uh, individual-based performance uh, management system in Asian cultures, and it just didn't work very well. Uh, for example, um, there was a very interesting article a few years ago about an American uh, company that was doing business in China. Uh, the article is relatively recent, but the story dates back to uh, about 10 years ago, maybe even a little more. And so the story goes about a um, uh, team of engineers that worked on some sort of an assignment and two of them came up with a very interesting engineering solution to some sort of a problem they had and so the American man management felt that you know these two did a very good job so maybe they should be uh, properly evaluated and so they offered them uh, gifts and at that time it was leather jackets I'm not sure with the company logo or not and as I said that the, the story goes back to some time ago uh, when China was much poorer than it is now and the leather jacket was a big deal so for a developing country like in Europe or in the United States it's probably an equivalent at that time of a I don't know like maybe a motorized scooter or, or maybe even a small car or something like that like it's a big deal and uh, it didn't work very well. So uh, at some point they noticed that there was something going on in the team and the two were basically bullied and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> harassed. And eventually when they found out what was going on, they just realized that this kind of approach, singling out single employees, uh, just is not very well taken in that culture. And eventually they had to buy a leather jacket for everyone on the team to alleviate the conflict. Uh, power distance is another dimension 
in some cultures uh, like in the United States the boss is just a guy who makes more money and has a bigger office in other cultures like in Japan for example power distance is huge so the boss is like semi god I mean this is a big difference and so uh, in the high power distance uh, cultures the boss is always perceived as a legitimate source of power of performance appraiser so almost like a father and so when the boss gives you some sort of a uh, feedback or um, comments or appraises your performance uh, nobody doubts that nobody argues with that so in other cultures especially where the power distance is low like it, it is for example in northern europe or perhaps in uh, the united states and canada in many cases you know when your manager especially if it's not a very senior manager gives you some sort of criticism or appraises your performance otherwise um, sometimes people just don't take it like oh shut up I mean you're gonna tell me what to do so in fact they frequently doubt their managers performance performance if you happen to be from one of these Western cultures you probably have had at least a few friends and maybe you yourself uh, when you openly or they openly disagreed with the boss's evaluation or if not openly then at least when they come home they would say oh my boss again yeah you know that jerk he uh, things that I'm not doing anything he doesn't understand so you believe that you may know your job better than your boss boss does and uh, so yeah so sometimes it's uh, a nasty world out there masculinity femininity again in masculine cultures it's all about achievement and you know being better than others uh, winning is everything in feminine cultures it's more about harmony about the relationship and uh, again, when it comes to performance evaluation in masculine cultures, you kind of eat what you kill. So, um, you know, you need to know what you killed. Uh, whereas in feminine cultures, uh, it's much more, you know, let's be friends and uh, I'm not going to upset you with your poor performance evaluation. So things like that. And finally, um, uncertainty avoidance is another big dimension in the context of performance evaluation. In high performance, I mean, in high uncertainty avoidance cultures, uh, people want clear written rules about what needs to be done. Uh, they want clear instructions, and uh, when the performance evaluation is left up to the manager, subjective uh, managers subjective evaluation people are not very comfortable so they want some sort of a contract in place some sort of you know stipulation that explains how how, need, how it needs to be done so uh, yeah and in cultures with low uh, uncertainty avoidance people are okay with improvising so yeah sure let, let's go ahead and we'll see how it goes and you know hopefully you'll do well and if not that's fine too we'll work it out so definitely much more um, you know focused on uh, you know, let, let's do and see how it goes as opposed to the actual paperwork and all that other, you know, stuff that minimizes uncertainty. Universalism, particularism is another very important dimension. Uh, in Western cultures, it tends to be that people apply rules more universally. If somebody does well, great if somebody does poorly well I don't care who that person is my friend or my relative um, you know the rules are the rules and if you are late or if you underperform I'm gonna tell you in particular list cultures uh, the application of the rules uh, depends to a large extent on who the person is and if that person happens to be your relative or maybe friend or your kin then uh, in many cases the rules are bent and exceptions are made and if they are not um, it's a problem it may lead to conflicts and other things so if you have a friend in the organization let's say I don't know your employee subordinate uh, if you are friends and maybe I don't know have some other relative ties um, you would be expected to provide positive evaluation no matter what and if you don't um, it would be not understood it would not be taken well so and vice versa if you live in a universalist culture if you happen to make exceptions for your friends <laughs> that wouldn't fly uh, face saving concerns in some Asian cultures <clears throat> Uh, people care a lot and not only Asian by the way so but Asian culture is kind of known for that but you know happens everywhere 
people are very concerned about saving face and so when you deliver your um, performance appraisal even if performance is not very good you try to deliver in such a way that the person will not lose their face so you do it in private or perhaps you send in such words that the employee doesn't make look bad uh, in other cultures like for example again in the United States usually people care much less about that and uh, so in many cases you would be kind of you know uh, shamed in front of the whole group and you know you didn't do well so you know eat the consequences face the consequences finally um, in um, some cultures like for example the West people are normally guided or concerned with the feeling of guilt so if something's done wrong, we usually feel guilt because we didn't perform or didn't do right. Uh, whereas when uh, something like that happens in the Eastern cultures, people tend to feel shame rather than guilt. So it's not so much about feel, feel, feeling guilty about not doing their job or doing something wrong. It's more about being shamed or fe feeling the shame that they didn't perform, didn't meet the expectations. And so as a result, the way um, performance on the one hand should be appraised, on the, on the other hand that information should be used, has to take that into account. So it's a very important, you know, subtle but very important distinction. Before we get into how to appraise performance of your employees, let me first talk about why in many cases performance management uh, and performance appraisal systems fail. Number one reason is that many organizations don't have a performance appraisal system in place at all. Instead, managers believe that, you know, they kind of know how to do it intuitively. Oh, just give me that employee, I'll look in his eyes, or, you know, I know what my people have been doing the past month, so I'm going to tell you exactly how each of them is doing and performing. And um, the problem is that this approach is not as good as people think it is. Studies again and again show that when managers rely on intuition and observation, you know, everyday observation, they often provide bad information, especially when it has to be done with a larger group of people on a regular basis. Disaster. It doesn't work very well. People think it does work well. If you ask them, they think it works well. They think that they do a good job. But once you have a controlled study uh, where it's properly measured and evaluated and observed and experimentally tested, no, they don't. Unfortunately, they don't. Most managers first don't have clearly articulated objectives. So they just say, oh, you do your best and we'll figure out how, you know, uh, what it means, how you do. No, it's not very good to approach the problem that way. No, no, do your best and we'll see. I mean, there have, have to be clear objectives so people know what needs to be done. Unless it's some sort of a startup that nobody really knows what needs to be done, right? Uh, hardly ever, in fact, never almost, performance appraisal is appraised for quality. Even if there is something in place where, you know, uh, managers use to evaluate employees, hardly ever does somebody looks at what is being used to appraise performance of, ma uh, of employees and evaluates quality of this system. Hardly ever. In fact, in my organization now here at the university, when I said that we select the best professor, you know, and it's a difficult task, nobody actually tests what we do and sees if it's a good one or not. With peer evaluations, I mean with course evaluations provided by the students, we do look at the data, we try to understand if it's a good system or not. But again, not to the extent that the textbook would kind of recommend you to do, and I, I agree with that. Plus, again, you often have conflicting mo motives, uh, you know, uh, sometimes managers would be inclined to give high evaluations to their employees so that their department doesn't look bad because, you know, if your employees are performing bad, it reflects poorly on the um, managers and so they kind of have this incentive here to cheat a little bit. And they, there are all kinds of other biases that affect uh, performance evaluation that we will discuss in this lecture. Now, one of the biggest challenges dates or was described as far back as, uh, what, 35 years ago. Uh, Stephen Kerr was talking about something that he called uh, the folly of rewarding A while hoping for B. 
So his article was written almost half a century ago, but it remains as important and as relevant today as it ever was. And so there he was talking about the problem that many, if not most, people on this planet are compensated, are rewarded for A, but we kind of hope that they will do B. And I'll give you a few examples. For example, doctors, right? Medical doctors. They are hired and paid to cure employee, I mean, to cure patients, to make them feel better, right? But their compensation depends on treatment, not on cure, right? So we hire them, we reward them, uh, not reward, we hire them, we expect them to make sure that employ, I mean, that people don't get sick. And if they get sick, they get well soon. But in reality, we pay them for procedures, for hours that they spend treating employ I mean, treating patients. So we hope cure for cure, but we pay for treatment. And as a result, in many cases, doctors would have an incentive to perform more tests, even if not needed, to invest more hours, spend more hours on working with you because that's how they are paid and not necessarily make, making you healthy. We kind of hope that the two come together but you can see how it's not necessarily the case. Lawyers, same thing. We expect them to win cases, but we pay them for hours, right? So in most cases, those two kind of come together. The more hours is invested in your case, presumably the higher are the chances of winning, but it's not necessarily the same thing, right? So students, same thing. So we kind of want them to learn but they are rewarded when they get high grades. And so getting high grades and learning is not exactly the same things. Sometimes it's actually quite different. Managers of companies, again, we in reward them for you know hours that they spend or for stock with stock options, so for the price of the stocks of the company that they manage. But we kind of hope them to do something that will make the company successful in the long run. And success in the long run is not always the same as current the current price of shares, right? Or the number of hours the person invested in the job. So I hope you see this little but important difference. And as a result, uh, again, people would do what they're compensated for. And uh, what they're compensated for is not always what they are expected to do. So this is a very important thing. And as I said, it has been described you know we've known about this for 50 years still haven't figured that out and i bet it will not be much better in another 50 years now i want to show a very short video clip here just you know to make it kind of funny uh and uh to illustrate a few points uh, but i'm afraid if i include it in this video lecture the video lecture may be blocked by youtube as it was before uh, for apparently this is copyrighted content, I don't know. So I recommend that you stop here and watch the short video clip from the optional files. All right? Illustrates very well how sometimes uh, performance management is taken to um, an absurd level. So, question number one What should we appraise? Well, before we even talk about what we should appraise, we should discuss what constitutes performance. And it's not a simple question as it seems, or at least not at the first glance. <clears throat> For example, here on this slide, you see a so-called performance wheel. So this one lists 24 competencies that are related to a general, you know, regular employee uh, performance. And uh, not only there are many of these, and you probably would agree that most of them are important, but also different people would have different opinion as to how, first, which of these should be used at all, and second, how the ones that are used should be weighted. So maybe we should give more for the thinking factor, but less for motivation factor. I mean, who cares if the person is motivated as long as the person thinks and does, or vice versa. Does the person have to communicate well while performing the job? I mean, all those are important factors. So uh, it's also very important to re uh, remember that performance is not always uh, effectiveness. So in other words, 
effort is not always leading to a result. Somebody can be working really, really hard, but all the circumstances may be stacked against the person and so there may be no result. Uh, you have to decide which of the two you will be rewarding. Is it going to be the actual resort, result or just the effort, right? So excellent performance doesn't always lead to high profits for the company or for the position. Again, are you going to look at the actual financial performance or the performance that went into, you know, achieving that result? Um, plus, again, dollars are not always a result or a, an indicator of effectiveness. I mean, just making a lot of money doesn't necessarily always mean uh, doing a good job. If the clients, uh, I don't know, remain upset and will never come back, making a few dollars today may actually be a bad result rather than a good result. So they're important and it's it's, it's, it's very, I cannot stress it enough, it's very important to first decide what exactly constitutes performance for this employee, what exactly you're going to take into account, right? Second, who should be doing performance appraisal? Should it be the supervisor, the peers, the self, the person who is being evaluated, customers, subordinates? All those are good questions and we're going to talk about each of them separately. Uh, I'm just going to say that depending on what you choose, uh, the performance appraisals uh, legitimacy, readiness, availability may be different. So for example, you know, yes, it may be a good idea to give uh, a person a chance to self-evaluate or maybe use peer evaluations, but would it be a legitimate source of uh, performance appraisal or are there biases embedded there? Same thing with customers, same thing with subordinates. Are they always available? I mean, for some positions, customers may not be even available or it may be such a job where it's uh, impossible to ask customers what they think. If it's, let's say, you know, a grocery store and you want to appraise performance uh, of a uh, cleric who checks out employees, uh, I don't think you can really go and ask all of the customers to evaluate performance. Uh, peers, potentially, but they kind of work independently, so possibly, but not necessarily. Manager, does the manager know much about it? So all of those are, you know, difficult questions. Subordinates, the person doesn't have subordinates. So those are important, to, you know, difficult things to decide. So let's talk about them one by one and see what the pros and cons of each of them are. Supervisor ratings. Well, there are a number of advantages to this approach. Obviously, you um, have a person supervisor who presumably sees everybody's performance, everybody's performance, and has some sort of a benchmark or some sort of a threshold to compare performance of individuals against each other and against those benchmarks. So presumably the performance indicators will be weighted equally uh, and similarly to that of you know other employees in the organization. Uh, presumably, again, uh, the manager is respected, so credible, so his evaluations will be take as, taken as legitimate and uh, a credible and valid source of information. Plus, again, he has power and authority and possibly can, you know, enforce, use the data to enforce certain policies or rewards or punishments. The problem with that is that the manager doesn't always have the opportunity to observe performance. There is also so-called halo error and rater motivation, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. On top of that, when you deal with an international organization, cross-cultural group, in many cases the culture of the manager may be different from the culture in which, for example, the team operates or the culture of the employees on the team. And as a result, the way the manager sees the situation may be very different from what uh, or from how, uh, how the employees see the situation. And so as a result, uh, mistakes can be made in evaluation and uh, something that the employees know was the right practice in their culture may be pursued by the manager as a, as a completely inadequate type of performance. And so there may be some conflicts there. Happens all the time, by the way, all the time. For example, uh, you know, in some cultures, uh, treating your customers well is paramount and in many cases it would be even acceptable to uh, you know for the organization to sustain losses to please the customers in fact in the united states it seems to be the case in many cases customer is the king 
and uh, impact some customers, even in music organizations, but that's the culture. And so that's what managers expect. In other cultures, uh, like for example, again, my native Ukrainian culture, customers don't have many rights and are not regarded very well. And so for employees there, it's almost normal to be kind of a jerk towards your customers. And uh, so if an American manager saw what some of the Amer uh, Ukrainian, let's say, retail workers do in their communication with the customers, he would be outraged. He would be completely outraged. But in that culture, it's kind of acceptable. In that culture, customers kind of don't expect much more. And it's changing now, and I'm glad you see that. But again, uh, what a Ukrainian employee, especially in retail industry, can get away with over there would be unthinkable over here in the United States. Again, I wanted to show you a little uh, clip here that illustrates how sometimes, uh, you know, performance is managed and again, kind of a funny situation, but so true. I mean, it's funny because it's true. So, but again, uh, pause here, watch that video clip uh, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't want to include it in the lecture just for the, you know, copyright content uh, violation so that the lecture is not blocked. Now, peer ratings. On the one hand, this could be the most legitimate source of performance appraisal. Uh, the huge advantage of peer ratings is that your peers see your performance, right? You presumably work together and they see you all the time. So they have an excellent opportunity to observe your performance. And as a result, they are probably the best source of information on your performance. In many cases also there is a great number of your peers, I mean it's more than one usually, right? So that improves reliability. So even if somebody you know, is wrong in his or her evaluations, overall on average peer evaluations probably are a good indicator of performance. On the other hand, when you talk about peers, you have all kinds of disadvantages because first you have friendships, friendship, you have all those, uh, you know, he's my friend so I'm going to give him higher evaluations no matter what. At the same time, you may have competitive biases because, you know, uh, somebody is going to be promoted one day. You want it to be you, right? So uh, you kind of have an incentive to provide negative evaluations to your peers or there may be all kinds of subgroups within the team. And so you like these guys and give them high evaluations. You don't like those guys, you give them low peer evaluations. So it's a very important, you know, uh, distinction here. And you kind of should rely on peer evaluations, but take them very carefully. Plus, again, peers may not have the needed legitimacy. They may um, uh, weigh um, performance evaluations differently because, you know, you know somebody, you don't know somebody, so you may assign more weight to something rather than to something else. So there are all kinds of things going on there. Plus, again, many peers are just not qualified to do performance evaluation, especially if it's some sort of a uh, job where, you know, not many skills are needed and so people may come without proper experience to do this kind of job. Customer ratings. Again, presumably the organization exists to make money by delivering the right service or product to the customer. And presumably the customer is the ultimate authority on the quality of the organizational performance. Right? So as a result, you kind of, you know, should trust your customers in evaluating performance of your employees. So uh, in most cases, customers have little bias, so they have no incentive to provide better or worse evaluations to your employees. After all, they don't know who those people are, they don't care what, you know, what they say, so why not say the truth, right? Plus, again, they are the closest to the actual results. But there are a number of limitations, and if you ever worked in an organization where customers were there, right, like retail or service or some sort of technical support, you would know that in many cases, customers have very limited or even no knowledge about what it takes to perform your job, right? So they may kind of be happy or unhappy with the product itself, but they really may not have the knowledge needed to evaluate your performance. They don't see what you do, right? They don't know what it takes to deliver the service. So, you know, you got to take it very, very carefully. In many cases, customers would provide feedback only, only if they are really, really upset about something. So if everything goes fine, they just, you know, check out and leave. 
they complain or come back and share their feedback on performance only when they are dissatisfied. So that creates a huge selection bias. So uh, if you go to any of those, you know, customer feedback boxes, I bet 99% of that will be negative feedback because everybody else who was happy just, you know, said thank you and left. So that's very important. Plus, again, customers usually have no time and no desire to do it. And even if you offer some sort of a compensation, in many cases, they just don't want to do it. And so, as I said, the only ones who do it are really the ones who are emotionally either upset or maybe happy. And that's a small and a very selectively biased uh, sample. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that's a problem. Yeah, uh, student course evaluations. You know, if you are a professor, I guess your customers are students. And uh, at the end of the semester, they always evaluate you. And uh, yes, they are best suited to evaluate professor performance, much better than anybody else because they see performance. But again, they don't always see what it takes to organize a course. Uh, they don't always, you know, see all the things that are going on. And, you know, sometimes may kind of misjudge as to how much you invested in the course. And frankly, it doesn't happen often. I mean, my evaluations, uh, I'm very happy and find them very fair and developmental. Hardly ever do you see a comment that makes no sense. In most cases, yes, they are very close. Uh, so it's, it's, it's as good as it gets, I guess. But even there, you know, if peer evaluations, uh, course evaluations are not mandatory, then uh, in many cases you would get only like half of the class completing them and probably that's the half that was either very happy or unhappy with the course. So even there in this virtually perfect system there are still some sort of biases and you know uh, tendencies that may um, make the evaluations not as valid and not as reliable as we'd like them to be. But as I said, I mean it's a very good example of actually why it works rather than it doesn't. Oh, well, self-ratings, that's a whole different animal. Um, self-ratings are really useful because first employees feel that they have been given a chance to voice their opinion. And that's important. Uh, it reduces the halo error, presumably. And again, we'll talk about what halo error is, but it's kind of bias of generalization. And uh, presumably people, when they evaluate themselves, you know, they know all, every aspect of themselves, not just one. They know the actual job and they know what exactly took them to complete the job, right? Uh, so it's, it's a good step in the de developmental process. But um, uh, peer evaluations are always positively biased. So people tend to evaluate their own performance much better than performance of other others. And they weigh performance differently than what the organization wants them to weigh it. I'll give you a few examples. I actually have a very interesting data set uh, stemming from the Exculture project that I manage. Uh, we have about, what, 4,000 students every semester, many teams, and uh, people are constantly every week evaluated by their team members, but then they are also evaluated by professors, and then we also have self-evaluations. And uh, two particular numbers stand out. I mean, they make mathematically little sense, but uh, illustrate very well how self-evaluations could be flawed. One is the actual peer evaluations. We evaluate them on a one to five point scale. And uh, self-evaluations are always about 1.5 points higher than peer evaluations. Hardly anyone, hardly ever gives himself herself less than four. On average, people give themselves 4.9. So on a five-point scale, people almost always give themselves uh, perfect valuations. And I don't know why that is. Is that because they really feel that they do well or they just want to get a better grade and so they kind of inflate their own self-evaluation? But it's very, very high. When you look at evaluations provided by the peers, on average, they are 3 point something, 3.5, sometimes 3.8, depending on the semester. So peers always feel that you perform less than what you feel, or at least what you report. But funny enough, they feel that you are not performing well, but they would give themselves at that same very you know, moment when they do the evaluation much higher grades. So it's not that some people are biased, it's everybody is biased. I mean, pretty much everybody always you know, makes that mistake. 
Another interesting, th interesting thing is that um, in different cultures, people are differently kind of self-promoting. So for individualist cultures, we see a greater difference between self versus other evaluation. So people tend to be more self-promoting. In uh, collectivist cultures, uh, people tend to be more kind of self-efficing. So they are m more modest in their own evaluations. And again, that cultural difference uh, may suggest that different people perform differently, but no, it's more how they actually do the evaluations. Then another very interesting number that we look at is um, uh, every week we ask people to tell us what percentage of all the work completed last week was completed by each team member, including you individually. And so with the average of about seven members per team, as you can imagine, the average um, uh, percent of work completed by an individual would be roughly, what, 15 or 16, right? So 100 divided by seven or whatever number of two team members. So that gives you, what, like 16% or 15% on average. And when you do it across all of the people, that's roughly what you get, sometimes slightly higher, sometimes low, slightly lower, but it averages, you know, just right. But when you look at the self-evaluations versus other evaluations, self-evaluations, <laughs> so you have six people, let's say, or seven people on the team, and uh, you look at the overall, you know, how much each individual performed, and on average it would be like 17% per, per person. But if you look at the self-evaluations, on average a person claims that he or she completed about 40% of all the work completed by the team last week. Like literally, I'm not kidding. On average, people see or feel that they do, if not most, then about half of all the work. So if you add all the self-evaluations in the team, you get a total of like something like 340%, meaning that people greatly, greatly overestimate of how much they personally do compared to the rest of the team. So self-ratings are useful, but <laughs> as I said, there are many things here going on. Now, here is a cartoon that kind of explains how it works. Yes, so there are all kinds of biases and when people evaluate peers, sometimes it's not about the actual performance, sometimes it's about, you know, what sort of numbers will give me more money, right? Now, many organizations or uh, consultants advocate the so-called 360-degree review. So that's where people evaluates himself, herself, right? Plus gets supervisory evaluations, subordinate evaluations, customer evaluations, and peer evaluations. Sounds very good in the theory, and I'm all for it. I'm just going to say that it's on the one hand difficult to do, it just takes time to survey all those people. Second, uh, often you would get conflicting results, so let's say your customers love you but your peers don't or vice versa, and so the result is kind of difficult to reconcile all those differences. Uh, so it's the right way to go, but it takes more resources and more time and uh, not always the most optimal way to go. <coughs> So it's more comprehensive, it's better data, it's more consistent information, but it's very, very demanding. And sometimes people may just feel overwhelmed with managing it and dealing with all that information. All right, so imagine that you decided what exactly you want to appraise. The question becomes how exactly I'm going to appraise it. Appraise it. And it's not as difficult as it may look. Uh, I'm going to give you a few examples and uh, you will see that sometimes different people will have different opinions. When I teach this course in class, I would give my students something that looks like this. I would give them a photocopy of a real math test uh, from a real student, and it looks something like this. So it's three students, um, let me just minimize it so it fits better the screen, three students who completed a test and um, you basically have very simple math problems, as you can see here, and you have their evaluations. And then I would ask my students to rate quality of the answers on a 1 to 10 scale. Every time I'm amazed that for every single student in this example, 
uh, and for every single question on this list, you would have in a class of, let's say, 20, 30 students, there will be some people who will give one and some people who will give 10 for the same answer. And a huge number of people would be anywhere between three and nine. You know, uh, all of these answers have some slight errors in them. And again, different people will have a very, very different opinion as to, you know, what grade the person should get for this kind of answer. Now, this is a simple test. It's math. I mean, right? It's right or wrong. I mean, it's, it's as obvious, as straightforward as it gets. And even here, different people would give you a very different performance evaluation for the same task. And again, I wish I was delivering this class in classroom where there are several students and I would ask you to evaluate this stuff and I know that you would have different opinions as to what should be given to each of the students in terms of, you know, their grade. And then you would look around and you would think, are those people crazy? I mean, this work doesn't deserve more than, let's say, two or ten or whatever you think it is. And there will be several people in the classroom with the same background as you, same age as you, same knowledge as you, and they will have a drastically different opinion as to what the fair grade here is. And so that's the whole point. I mean, it's, it's, it's even on simple tasks like that, it's, you know, impossible. Another example, go to ratemyprofessors.com. Type any name of any professor you took a class uh, with, or just any random name, John Smith, right? And look at what the person gets at Rate My Professor. You will see that there is, again, a huge difference. Some people love John, some people hate John. It's the same class, he did the same job, it's exactly the same performance. And yet, the clients in this case, the customers, the students, will have a very different opinion. Uh, my evaluations seem to be fairly consistent. Uh, it's been a long time since I checked and I don't, didn't have many at that time, I guess. Maybe different now, but again, you look at some and you would see that people will give, you know, some people hated the professor, others loved the professor. And you would think it's exactly the same lecture. Why would it be different? So um, not as simple and consistent as it may look at the first glance, right? Um, again, talking about, for example, things that need to be taken into account when you evaluate uh, performance. Again, since I'm delivering this lecture to students, I'm going to use uh, examples from academia so you can relate to them. In the Exculture project that I manage, it's uh, you know, a project where students from all around the world uh, work in global virtual teams and complete a business consulting project. Right? And so as a manager of the project, I compile all kinds of information on student performance, peer evaluations, ability to meet deadlines, uh, results on the tests, uh, quality of the reports that they provide, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's over 100 different dimensions that we look at. And uh, I give all that information to people, to professors of those students. So the students come from like 100 universities and uh, each class has a different professor. So I give the professors all of the information I have. Same information, all of the information I have. And it's up to the professors how they use that information. And it's actually quite different how different people use that information. For example, in some cultures, professors really love peer evaluations. They assign a huge portion of the weight to peer evaluations and they say it's all about what your peers tell me about your performance. Other professors would go with quality of the report. They would say, I don't care if you met the deadlines, I don't care if your team loved you, I care about the quality of the work you did, and even if you missed everything else, if the report is excellent, that's all I used. And so, for example, um, Europeans hardly ever use peer evaluations at all. For some reason in Europe, they say that sometimes it's even against the university policies. So they cannot use performance of others, you know, when we talk about team performance. Uh, so they cannot use performance of others or evaluation of others in student evaluations. So they almost exclusively rely on quality of the report. Agents tend to value peer evaluations a lot and in many cases give more to peer evaluations than to the quality of the actual report. Americans use a combination. They seem to value both more or less equally and seem to use a combination. But again, different cultures have very different approaches here. Yet another clip that I wanted to show you. It's in optional reading, so just look at it and uh, see uh, you know, when you have a minute. Uh, or pause here and watch it now. I'm not going to embed it in the lecture just because it may block um, the you know, 
content of the lecture for the copyright violation reasons. And I don't think I violate anything here, but I guess it's a clip from a movie, so probably you know, we shouldn't put it here. Now, you've evaluated performance of the man I mean of your employees, and the question becomes how do you share that information? Do you have a one-on-one -on -one session? Do you uh, deliver it in front of the entire group? Do you deliver it at, at all? Um, well, this is what we know about feedback seeking and feedback giving. giving. Uh, people, people from some cultures tend to be extremely interested in feedback and, uh, for example, Americans have been described as feedback seekers. So they want to know how they do and they want to get performance evaluations. Uh, Asians tend to be much more uncomfortable with uh, performance appraisal, uh, worry much more about it, and uh, they're especially uncomfortable with publicly available ratings. I've had a number of cases, as I said, where I would publicly share performance of professors with other professors. It's like not just, you know, selectively. The whole list, and this is how you do compare it to others. Didn't work very well, especially with some cultures. Middle East and Asia, they don't take it very well. In fact, in many cases, I would get an email from some professors who specifically provide negative comments on this policy, right? They especially hate rankings when you... Uh, rank people and you say, you know, Professor John Smith, for example, is number one in his class doing best and your class is number 17 on the list of 100. They don't seem to like it, so they feel that there is much more to performance than just a rank. And so, in fact, they kind of have all those jokes about Americans uh, and believe that, you know, Americans like rankings and uh, they like to look at that single number and believe that it tells you something. So they tend to look at it in a more kind of holistic way and uh, they feel that uh, it's inadequate and sufficient to just look at a number and have the results. So go and figure. Americans on the other hand love transparency, love openness and uh, if you tell them that you're not going to reveal to them how did you compare it to others or if you just name for example top five performers and not say anything about anyone else they in many cases would be upset and say no i want to see the whole list i want to see how i compared i want to see you know how exactly you came to that conclusion what you put in those rankings how did you derive them so they they want to know all those details uh, whereas as i said asians uh, almost don't want to know they they don't feel you know don't find them legitimate enough and kind of encourage you not even do it not let alone share it now let's talk about specific errors that people make when um, evaluating performance of others. One and probably the biggest error people make is so-called halo error. You know what halo is, right? When you see all those icons, you know, of holy people, sometimes you would see that kind of ring above the head. That's what they call the halo. And so uh, on all those paintings of the holy people, that halo usually signifies that the person is kind of holy or, you know, in Catholic church is, uh, you know, that's a, one of the saints, for example, right? Uh, and so the halo error is the bias or tendency to assign properties or qualities of one person in a particular area to all other areas. So if you like someone in, for example, his performance on task A, you tend to assume that the person is good at everything else. If, uh, if for example, a person looks good, just, you know, good looking person, we tend to assume that the person is good at everything else. Or if the person is a good speaker, right? You know, speaks very persuasively, very clearly, we again tend to assume that the person is really knowledgeable and really knows his stuff and really good at work uh, doing things and things like that right and vice versa if there is something bad about the person you don't like you know his appearance or his perhaps performance on a particular task we tend to assume that the person is not good at anything else and uh, so we kind of attribute that particular trait to the whole personality or whole spectrum spectrum of performance of that person and um, so uh, in many cases that has this negative effect on performance evaluations if you like a person for something and as i said it could be anything you tend to give him high evaluations on everything else and vice versa where it's usually manifested uh, i mean where i see it most and in fact i see it literally hundreds and hundreds of times every single semester that's when you look at performance evaluations of students 
provided by the professors. And so they look at all kinds of things, but the biggest one is the actual report that the students write. And the reports are evaluated on multiple dimensions. And uh, we ran all kinds of tests to see how, for example, um, evaluation of uh, formatting of the report correlates to the evaluation of innovativeness of the idea. And we evaluate innovativeness of the idea, creativity, formatting, grammar, uh, attention to detail, uh, quality of the analysis, about seven or eight different dimensions. Surprisingly, all of them correlate virtually perfectly. Moreover, if you look at number one dimension that we use, which is appearance of the project, so literally how neat it looks, how clean it looks, it's a perfect predictor of the actual grade. Um, literally, you don't have to read the report, you just look at how clean it looks, and you can predict what other professors will tell about this particular report. In fact, those business reports are evaluated also by the companies for which they are written, and it's usually the same problem. So that tells you that either students, or in fact many participants in Exculture are not even students, they are just regular business employees. So it tells you that if a person can present a report in a nice, clean, neat way, if the title page looks cool and, you know, clean, then the person is excellent in everything else. The person is creative, provides excellent analysis, makes excellent decisions, and writes an excellent business proposal. I don't believe that. I believe we are dealing with the halo error. People like the appearance and they assume everything else is good, or vice versa, everything else is good and they give you high performance, I mean high evaluation on appearance. Uh, so I don't know, one of the, you know, the, the one affects the other. But the problem here is, again, I mean, it's impossible that people who are creative would automatically be clean and neat. It's impossible that people who provide quality analysis would automatically write well. I mean, there may be some correlation, like real correlation, but more likely than not, virtually perfect correlations among those dimensions is an effect of halo error. It's exactly the same thing with everything else. Uh, you are always on time to work, your manager likes you, probably you'll get high evaluations and everything else. Vice versa, you are late at work sometimes. You may be an excellent performer, but your manager sees your poor performance in this very visible you know, area, chances are you will be rated down on everything else because of that halo error. If you can do well here, I can't even expect you to do well in something else, right? Contrast effect. Uh, when people evaluate people, they tend to not give you an abstract evaluation. They tend to evaluate you compared to others. And um, as a result, if you happen to have a strong team or someone who is stronger on your team than you are, chances are your evaluations will be low. If that guy is strong, you may be strong too, but if he gets five and you are a little weaker than he is, you would be getting three or maybe even two, just because of that contrast. If there was no that guy, you would be getting fives because you would be perceived as the, as the strongest. And so as a result, your one or five or three or four on the scale may be greatly affected by who else is evaluated rather than your actual performance. And again, in some cases, that's not a problem. If the goal is to determine who's the best, that's all good. But if the goal is to determine how you do, not necessarily compared to others, just how you do, that may be a problem. Especially it's a problem when you have a multi-level organization and uh, you are evaluating your team but then there are many other teams and somebody else is also evaluated in their team. And what if it happened to be the case that in your team you have someone who is stronger, who performs better than you do? Then you will get threes and maybe fours or maybe twos because you are a little weaker. What if on another team there is no strong person and so your competitor, the guy who may be up for promotion against you, uh, performs exactly like you do, not any better but there is no one stronger on his team, so his evaluations automatically will be higher. So when comparing you two, you may look much weaker compared to that person, even though your performance is exactly the same. And the only reason your performance is perceived weaker is because you have someone even stronger than you are. So as a result, that may be a big problem. Recency effect, we tend to pay much more attention to what happened recently than uh, to what happened longer ago.
So your performance in the last week before the performance evaluation is much more important than the whole previous year. So unfortunately, uh, you know, you don't want to get sick before your performance appraisal and you definitely want to work much harder because as I said, recency effect, people value much more what happened just now and they tend to forget what happened before. You can be an excellent performer for the whole year, but make one mistake a day before the performance evaluation, they'll forget all your wonderful performance recently and vice versa. You could have, you know, done a poor job all year, but if you impress your boss, in the last day before the performance appraisal, chances are your overall evaluations will be dramatically improved. And here is a <laughs> little cartoon on that topic. Now, studies show that that effect, recency effect, even manifests itself in sports competitions. Uh, a number of studies have been conducted where, um, you know, the sport involves judges judging, like for example, figure skating or synchronized swimming, where it's not, you know, how fast you run, but how beautiful, you know, your performance is. Uh, and um, uh, studies consistently show that the athlete who, who goes last tends to get um, comparatively higher evaluations than those who go first, adjusted for, you know, in which order the people appear. Because sometimes the, really the stronger people would be put last, but adjusting for that, still people who go last tend to have an unfair advantage. So that tells me or tells you that when you, for example, interview for a job, try to schedule your interview as late as possible so that you are the last one in the pool to be interviewed. Uh, if you can do that, you will have a slight advantage over everybody else. Now, this is where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much, and that concludes the lecture.